Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming in the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Ukrainian officials say Russia unleashed a missile barrage on Ukraine, reaching areas far from the front lines. This is a top aide to President Zelensky, tells ABC News the conflict is now in a decisive phase. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge is in Kyiv, Ukraine, with more. Tom, what do Ukrainian officials mean when they call this a decisive phase? The Ukrainians have a window, and that window is the summer, effectively. When the fall comes, the rains will arrive and the ground will soften. Any military offensive actions, any movement by armoured vehicles is way harder uh, once the, the ground softens. So the Ukrainians know they have to take advantage of the summer. They want to avoid a stalemate in this war. They believe, with their Western partners, that if Russian army just sits on a static front line, it will only be a matter of time until Russia once again attacks. And therefore, the Ukrainians believe that they have to capitalise on the momentum that they've been building over the last few weeks and months. But the reality on the ground is that the counteroffensive right now is incredibly slow. It's incredibly tough. The Ukrainians are making very small gains in very small areas of the front lines, and the cost is high. The casualties we're picking up on, we don't have official figures, but anecdotally, the casualties, the number of soldiers being injured in particular, is very, very high. Well, Ukraine says drones hit several grain storage sites in the south. Now the country's accusing Russia of trying to block food exports. What's the latest on the extent of the damage, and could this affect the global food supply? It could definitely affect the global food supply, or really global food prices, to be precise, Diane, because before the war, Ukraine was producing many important food export uh, substances. For example, ha about, about half of the world's sunflower oil was produced in Ukraine before the war. Now, Ukraine has basically been trying to get some of those vital food exports, which really go to predominantly countries in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, but what Russia has done is basically unilaterally pulled out of a, of a deal. We've seen extensive damage from repeated strikes by the Russians on these ports, and it's a precarious situation. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Ahmed Ali walks the aisles of a supermarket in Yemen's port city of Aden. The price of basic goods is increasing every day. He and millions of others simply can't keep up. After some careful calculations, he has to put some food back on the shelf. The father of four, who works as a night watchman, explains just how difficult it's become 
to feed his family. Prices have soared recently. The value of our local currency has declined sharply. We can't afford to buy basic commodities. I came here simply to buy basic food items. I'm shocked by the prices. We demand that the authorities find a solution. Yemen imports 90% of its food. Nearly 50% of its wheat came from Ukraine and Russia. The consequences of that war being felt on these streets. Yemen itself has experienced nearly a decade of conflict. And with fewer countries trading with Yemen, foreign exchange is drying up. The local currency, the real, is losing its value. Last year's inflation topped at 40 percent. Salaries are not paid on time. We get paid every three or four months. Needless to say, the cost of living is rising and the power of our currency is declining. As a pensioner, I cannot afford to buy what my children need. Many citizens remain at home to spare themselves the agony. Business analyst Sami Kasim says the civil war has brought the economy to its knees. Nearly 60 percent of Yemen's population lives in extreme poverty, according to the United Nations, where hunger is a daily reality. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. Millions of people are running out of food in Sudan. That's the warning from the United Nations on Tuesday. Some are dying due to lack of health care after four months of war that have devastated the capital Khartoum and sparked ethically driven attacks in Darfur. UN agencies said in a joint statement that time is running out for farmers to plant the crops to feed them and their neighbours and medical supplies are scarce, adding that, quote, the situation is spiralling out of control. The UN spokesman for the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is Jens Larka. These leaders of global humanitarian organizations warn that the war is destroying people's lives and their homelands and violating their basic human rights. They call on the parties to the conflict to end the fighting, protect civilians, and give humanitarian organizations unfettered access to all people in need in all areas of Sudan. The conflict between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces erupted on April 15th over tensions linked to a planned transition to civilian rule. More than 4 million people have been displaced. That includes more than 1 million people who are estimated to have fled to neighboring countries, according to new figures from the International Organization for Migration. Civilians in war-affected states have been killed in attacks. Elizabeth Throssell is spokesperson for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Now, while it's difficult to establish an exact number of casualties due to the intensity of the fighting, and the fact that the remains of many of those killed have not been collected, identified or buried, Tentative figures indicate that more than 4,000 people have so far been killed. The millions who remain in Khartoum and cities in the Darfur and Kordofan regions have faced rampant looting and long power communications and water cuts. Efforts led by Saudi Arabia and the United States to negotiate a ceasefire in the current conflict have stalled and humanitarian agencies have struggled to provide relief because of insecurity, looting and bureaucratic hurdle. Less than a year after a landmark peace deal, the threat of civil war looms once again over northern Ethiopia. The country's MPs approved a national state of emergency on Monday as fighting continues to rage in the Amhara region. Peace and security issues are a threat to the constitutional order and to national sovereignty. In this situation, it is necessary to declare a state of emergency. Ethiopia's second largest region has witnessed heavy fighting since early July. Tensions began to rise in April when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said he wanted to dismantle various paramilitary groups across the country, a declaration perceived as a betrayal by Amhara militias that fought alongside the army during the Tigray conflict and that decided to take up arms. Fierce fighting recently saw the government retake control of the region's main towns and cities, but the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission says the violence has taken a heavy toll, especially on civilians.
Fighting in and around cities and towns across the Amhara region involved the use of heavy artillery, resulting in the deaths and injuries of civilians. What is suspected to have been a drone uh, targeted the town on Sunday morning. Local medics put the death toll at at least uh, 30 deaths, but some Ethiopian media have estimated it to be as high as 70, with dozens of fatalities not reported to hospitals. People are also reportedly dying from a lack of oxygen, which is in short supply uh, because of the blockade of uh, the road of the region uh, by local militia. Uh, the clashes began in April over Amara and the rejection of a federal decision uh, to dismantle regional special forces. Uh, some critics say the move will weaken the region. Uh, the national defense forces have taken back uh, control of several cities in Amara, but overall the conflict is still marked. Uh, there's still not been any official death toll, but uh, many civilians uh, have been have been killed. Uh, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission uh, has called uh, on the government uh, to stop the arrest and persecution of ethnic Amarans in the capital, Addis Abeba. It's also called uh, on both sides to stop the fighting in the region itself. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. On the 11th of August, Pakistan celebrated its National Day of Minorities. Now, on paper, it was a celebration of brotherhood and tolerance in Pakistani society. But in reality, it was yet another day of brutality against minorities once again in the name of blasphemy. Have a look at these images. This is how Pakistan is uplifting its minorities. These visuals are from the city of Faisalabad in Pakistan's Punjab province. They show a group of extremists vandalizing a church. Why? Over allegations of blasphemy. Hundreds of people armed with sticks and batons stormed a local Christian colony in Faisalabad's Janwala area on Wednesday morning. Here they attacked and set ablaze four churches and several adjoining buildings. The churches attacked include the Salvation Army Church, United Presbyterian Church, Allied Foundation Church and Sherunawala Church. These attacks were apparently triggered by the alleged blasphemous actions of two local Christians and there is no clarity yet on what blasphemy they committed but fundamentalists and extremists don't need clarity you see. A rumor, a whisper is enough to bring out the vengeance lying below a thin surface. And now have a look at this tweet. It's from the moderator bishop of the Church of Pakistan. He posted several images, in fact, of the extremists attacking the church. Attached was a heart-wrenching caption. Words fail me as I write this. We bishops, priests and lay people are deeply pained and distressed at the Jaranwala incident in the Faisalabad district in Pakistan. A church building is being burned. As I type this message, Bibles have been desecrated and Christians have been tortured and harassed, having been falsely accused of violating the Holy Quran. We cry out for justice and action from law enforcement and those who dispense justice and the safety of all citizens to intervene immediately and assure us that our lives are valuable in our own homeland that has just celebrated independence and freedom. Those are some strong words there. So what exactly are Pakistani authorities doing about this is the immediate question. Are they doing anything at all, in fact? 
Well, the Punjab police think that it has launched an investigation, not action, just an investigation. An investigation that may take up the rest of our lives. And as for Pakistan's leaders, they haven't even acknowledged the incident, leave alone condemning it. This is what Shehbaz Sharif posted today, a tweet condemning the desecration of the Holy Quran in Sweden. What about the desecration of places of worship back home? What about the attack on these four churches that unfolded today? We scrolled through his handle. He hadn't even posted one comment on the incident. Why would he? Such attacks, after all, have become a regular affair in Pakistan. Just three months back in April, a church in Pakistan's Khokar town came under attack. It was pelted with stones and bricks by a mob of around 40 armed men. In February this year, two Christian farmers were killed in Pakistan. One of them was beaten to death by his Muslim landowner. In January, a guava farmer was gunned down for resisting the stealing of fruits from his orchard. He too was a Christian, by the way. He was killed by three Muslim youths and reports say the accused are still walking free. You think that is unforgivable? Then have a look at this report. In the month of April, a 15-year-old Christian girl was kidnapped. She was abducted by a 60-year-old Muslim who later forcibly married her and converted her to Islam. The girl's family says they went to the police but the cops refused to accept her complaint. And it does not end there. Just last year, a Christian priest was shot dead in Peshawar. What was his crime, you ask? No one knows. The Peshawar police, in fact, has linked the attack to terrorist elements. Even schools run by Christians are under attack. Last year, a school in Pakistan's Shekhupura city was ransacked by a group of Goons and reports say at least 14 armed men raided the school, tortured the staff and damaged their vehicles. Why is that? Because this school was providing free education to Christian students. And these were just a few instances, by the way. There are many more. The list is long. There are many more stories of horror. Many more accounts of atrocities. But you get the point here. The life of Pakistan's Christians has become a living hell. And these numbers tell you the story. In 1998, Christians made up 1.59% of Pakistan's population. In the year 2021, this figure had dropped to just 1.27%. If I speak of literacy, only 35% of Christians in Pakistan are literate. According to an Islamabad-based NGO, and as per media reports, over 80% of Christian family units of six to eight people live in two-room houses. And let's not even talk about the kind of jobs that they do. To this day, every cantonment city in Pakistan has an area known as Lal Kurti. This is where Christians reside and do all jobs at the households of the generals. Jobs like laborers, cleaners, farmhands. One report says that 80% of sanitary positions in Pakistan are held by Christians. Have a look at this report. It's from December 2021. Let me quote what this Pakistani newspaper said about Christian workers. The Christian cleaners have kept the sewer system moving in Karachi's enormous port metropolis by unclogging, decaying the drain pipes of feces and dangerous hospital waste. I could go on with examples of the kind of treatment Christians in Pakistan are subjected to. But the thing here is, there is frankly very little that the world can do about it. Time and again, various global bodies have urged Pakistan to treat its minorities better. But you see, that is hoping for too much in today's weak, insecure and radicalized Pakistan. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. 
he will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. A blizzard of ash and embers as flames engulf the forest. Canada's Northwest Territories are being ravaged by more than 230 active wildfires. So this isn't any photo magic. In Fort Smith on the Territory's southern border, like onlookers nighttime. were stunned as the sky itself turned a deep orange from nearby fires. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau expressed his solidarity with affected residents as he announced the mobilisation of the Canadian Armed Forces to assist. The territorial government has declared a state of emergency. Hundreds of inhabitants from remote villages have been airlifted to safety after roads out were cut off by raging infernos. Now the wildfires are bearing down on the regional capital Yellowknife, home to some 20,000 people. They've been given until noon on Friday to leave. There is a possibility that without rain, the fire reaches the outskirts of Yellowknife by the weekend. It is approaching, but there's time to complete the community evacuation. It's being called now so that we can allow people the opportunity to drive while the highway is open. After up to 14 hours on the road, these evacuees are now safe in the neighbouring province of Alberta. It's so nice to come down here where you can actually breathe. And, not, and we washed our, our laundry this morning and all I could smell is the fire smoke. More than 13 million hectares of Canadian forest have gone up in smoke this year, nearly twice the country's previous record, as droughts and high temperatures brought on by climate change contribute to its worst fire season ever. As of Wednesday, officials reported more than 1,000 active wildfires across the country, with more than 670 burning out of control. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. We are also following a wildfire emergency in Canada. An entire town is racing to evacuate right now as the flames close in and Ginger is tracking the very latest. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning to you, Rebecca. The city is Yellowknife, the capital of Canada's Northwest Territories. It's got a population of about 20,000 people and they got to get everybody out by tomorrow when they anticipate the fire that is far too close for comfort to take over even the highway, the one that goes in and out. So this is one of 250 fires within the Northwest Territories and more than a thousand across Canada. We know they have had an unprecedented season, but this graphic that we're about to show you really puts it into perspective. This is 
all of the acreage burned to date. Look at 2023, nearly doubling their worst in the last 40 years of history. And so 600% of normal to date, an incredible one. And the impacts here have been smoke and they will be unhealthy air quality, Minnesota, Wisconsin, back into Oregon and parts of Washington state. Wow, that graph really just unprecedented there. Helicopters flying over scenes of devastation, trying to tackle the blaze spreading across the Canary Island of Tenerife. Yeah. Part of the green scenery that usually attracts millions of visitors a year now gone up in flames. Around 250 firefighters battled the wildfire with thick smoke forcing road closures and the evacuation of five villages. I went to sleep at about 2.30 or 3.30 and there was about a kilometer burning and I thought there's no stopping this. The fire broke out on Tuesday night raging through a forested area with steep ravines in the northeastern part of the island. Authorities said the flames have so far burned about 1,800 hectares. The disaster comes after the Canary Islands were hit by a heat wave that has left many areas tinned dry, increasing the risk of wildfires. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The news out of Maui and the death toll climbing to 111 overnight as we learn more about what may have sparked the first fire. For the first time, we're seeing new videos now of what may have started these fires in the first place, and they seem to point to downed power lines. It's all part of the investigation as the heartache here just grows. This morning, as the death toll continues to grow on Maui, new video surfaces raising questions as to what may have sparked the deadliest wildfire in modern U.S. history. 111 people now confirmed dead, hundreds unaccounted for. Search and rescue teams have covered 38% of the impact zone. FEMA, the Red Cross, and the military all on the ground. Watch as this security camera captures what could be an early trigger in that devastating wildfire. August 7th at 10.47 p.m., a day earlier, you hear a witness describe a flash that might be a tree falling on a power line. It's windy, and then there's a flash, and I think that's when a tree is falling on a power line. The power goes out. One expert saying those videos taken in upcountry Maui show the flames spreading and maybe the first evidence of downed power lines igniting a fire. We've got that video of that kind of explosion, and we've got 10 sensors in that community that show a very sharp drop in electrical voltage at precisely that same time. Power line just went down. By the next morning, August 8th at 6.37 a.m. in Lahaina, Shane True uses a garden hose to battle a fire. That's the power line that started. Started from up the road there and all of that is still burning. Authorities declaring that brush fire under control around 9 a.m., but then lost control of the flames hours later when the winds caused a flare-up to spread. By 5 p.m., Lahaina's historic Front Street up in flames. The loss weighing heavy as families are now being asked to provide DNA to account for the dead. Overnight, we spoke to the family of Bo Makai Estoris Lozano, the 28-year-old still missing since last Tuesday. His mother telling us police visited her home to swab for DNA. I want to hang on to the hope that he's alive, but after doing something like this, like, how do you hold on to that? This is the moment hillside homes in Shimla fell away during a landslide. Rescue workers in the Indian Himalayan town have pulled at least 15 bodies from the mud. Friends and family are waiting anxiously during efforts to find at least 12 people trapped under the rubble. At least six worshippers were killed at this temple when it collapsed during the landslide. The death toll is expected to rise. Bridges have collapsed and roads have been washed away. Thousands of people are stranded without power and communication networks are disrupted. Alerts have been issued for the hardest hit Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand states where more rain is forecast until Friday. The areas experienced widespread monsoon rain damage last month and recorded above normal rainfall since June. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. 
Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.